Okay, and, and this week's podcast episode is Lessons from Successful Turnarounds. I'm thrilled to introduce Matthias Campiani, Vice President of Business Development with Aurelius Group, a pan-European private equity firm focusing on carve-outs, operational turnarounds, and acquisitions of profitable, underperforming businesses with an equity sweet spot between a million and a hundred million dollars. He covers UK and pan-European private and public companies with revenues between 50 million to over a billion dollars. Matthias has over 35 years in CEO and executive positions. He's founded companies. He's been a partner in PE companies and board advisory roles in a wide spectrum of companies and industries, both in growth, turnaround, and M&A situations. Matthias, thank you so much, man. This is awesome. I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. Richard, it's great to spend an afternoon with you. Awesome. It's always awesome. enjoyable. Well, um, I've got to I've got to tell the the, the um, audience, listening audience here, you've got your 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 share there of espresso, so um, yes. it's going to have a whole lot of energy. I'm certain. <laughs> I do, I do. It's my second one, so I should keep awake and hopefully <laughs> be able to answer whatever question you have. All right. Well, you've got a wealth of information, so I'm sure there's going to be some great wisdom bites here. So, Matthias, let, let, let's let's frame the conversation. So. When we're talking about underperforming businesses, perhaps a, a turnaround strategy, what are the stages that you employ for a turnaround strategy? What are the stages? You mean, how do I select a company? Yes. How, how do you go about it? Yeah. How, okay. The first the first stage is, is selecting a candidate for a turnaround, right? And they are... Companies that you're going to look to turn around are companies that are underperforming their peers. They're yeah. companies that, that are not doing well. And, and this is important, the underperforming its peers, because it's relative. Because each industry has its own dynamics, its own profitability, its own type of margins. So I think the first asset test when we look at a company is to see if the EBITDA margin is below the average of the industry. Yeah. If the EBITDA margin is below the average of the industry, I think that is, is a pointer that says this is a candidate for a, a turnaround or at least for an improvement to add value to that company. Because if they're underperforming their peers, there has to be a problem there that's driven by management. So I think that that's the first step that, let's say, that we have to, to evaluate if the company would be a, a good candidate. Um, once we were able to identify a, a company that is is would fit our, our, the profile that we're looking that is, is poised for a turnaround, um, then we go a bit deeper. We, we know that this is a candidate, it, it's it's underperforming its, its peers. Um, there we will look at, at some metrics, let's say maybe gross, gross profit and net profit. Look at that because the, the gross margin, let's say that will identify where is the problem? Is the problem in the manufacturing? Is the company buying bad and they're not buying well? Or is the problem more in operational expenses, in overheads? So that will help us very fast, let's say a first approach to identify where can the issue lie? In what part is it? And usually these companies, then the next step that we use to evaluate is, okay, uh, this company is underperforming. It's got a problem, let's say in overheads, it's the overheads are too high. Usually these companies have liquidity issues. And that's why they are close to, uh, let's say, a distressed or a poised for a turnaround. They've got some liquidity issues. So there we use typical liquidity measures, right? Um, the, the working capital ratio, well, that you know that it's going to have an issue there. But then you go a bit deeper and you look at its DSOs, days of sales outstanding. Are they too long? Uh, the days payable is outstanding. Are they? Are you paying too short? Where, where is it? Where do we have room to be able to increase or improve liquidity? And certainly inventory uh, turnaround. How often is it turning around its inventory? Do we have too much cash tied up in, in the inventory? So these are some of the metrics that we look at to, to frame and, and find a, a suitable candidate for, for a turnaround. Got it. Okay. And Mateus, so that's the assessment and I guess a bit of diagnosis. Um, and then yeah. I would imagine as part of your process here, you're getting into the strategy and the planning phase as to what you're supposed to do. Um, and then, of course, execution and implementation. And then, of course, we'll talk a little bit more about post turnaround, stabilization and growth. Are those the basic buckets when we frame yeah. the process of the turnaround? Okay. 
Right, it's, right, right. That, that, that's correct. So we identify the candidate. Then what we'd like to do is before acquiring the company, already have a plan in place. Yep. Uh, usually time is of the essence when you go into a distress situation. You don't have time is not your, your friend. So you really have to act fast. So what we try to do is formulate a, an initial plan before actually going into the company. OK, and that would be it could be in the, in the form of a 100 day plan. What are the first things we're, we're going to do in, in the company? And um, usually the, the problem, as we said, the problem is underperforming management. Management has to be or is an issue. So the first thing is to do an assessment of the management team. Uh, what are the problems there? And there we have to act fast and decisively. Who do we have to change in, in the management team? And um, sometimes, well, we will step in into the company into, and actually bring our people to assume some interim managerial roles. But usually there's a lot of know-how within the company and maybe at deeper levels within the organization. So maybe it's not the top managers, but there is know-how of the company below that. So maybe there's people that you could bring up and have them cover uh, positions or higher positions that they were, but you already then capitalize on the history and the know-how of the company. So you're not bringing in somebody from that has to learn everything or how it's working. Um, so if you have little time um, because of liquidity issues, we, we try to see what expertise is within the company and, and to identify what are the people that could help us leading the, the turnaround of the company that are within the, the company. So that, that would be the, the first thing, let's say it's a, it's a leadership review. The second one is the financials. The second one is the financial health of the company. Um, there, um, let's say that the first step that we would do is cash is king in these situations. So basically you have to sit on top of the cash and make sure no cash goes out of the company that should not. And, and how do you do that? Depends on the size of the company. You could We start by first centralizing all treasury functions. All treasury has to come to, to one place um, and, and then have very strict cash flow management uh, process. And, and usually what we do there is we will put together a cash flow committee that meets once a week. And that brings in people from the different areas, from all areas, sales, uh, purchasing, uh, production. So from all areas, you sit down and we go over the cash flow. What are the expenditures that we will be doing that week? What is the money that will be coming in? Because it's important that you change the mindset of people in the company and that there is a strong sense of urgency on how we have to act. That, that's very important. So you want to ensure that all the organization is focused on the right things. And at this point in a distress situation, the right thing is cash preservation. So uh, along with, with our turnaround, something that I should have said before, communication is key. And the communication, when we go into the company, the first thing you have to do is communicate internally to your team, to the company, the changes that are going to occur, that you need their support, that it's going to be rough times ahead, but to make sure everybody is aligned. But then it's also important, the communications with uh, the different stakeholders, with your customers, with your suppliers, because if the company is in distress, they have been feeling that somewhere. They they know there are problems. Yeah, the suppliers are not getting paid. The customers they're being delayed in their in their shipments. Uh, there is usually a chaotic situation in the company. So it's very important that they know that new management stepped in. That steps are going to be taken to change the direction of the company. So communication is key. And these cash flow meetings that that we organize. Communication is also key in, in that uh, because you don't know where your sources of liquidity are going to come from. Uh, so what we've, we've sometimes if, if the products that you're producing are critical for your clients, they will very likely be able to um, give you loans, make prepayments if they understand the, the situation. If you help them understand the situation, they could very easily step in to to help you so cash flow is is the second thing we will really attack and and really work on 
once we have a process in place in the cash flow and everybody is aware and, and their sales could come up and say, well, from this customer, we believe that we can either increase prices or we can have them pay earlier uh, from the from the uh, supply side. We know which suppliers we can well negotiate with and so forth. Once that process is working, then we go to the third uh, process, let's say, or bucket, which would be operational improvements. Uh, those take a little bit longer. Um, and, and for that, the, the first thing we do there is cut all expenses which are not critical. Cut all the expenses that are, that are not critical. Really a cost reduction because you have to bring this cost reduction mindset to the people. That, that not cost reduction, but that there's awareness of, 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 of passion and money. Then what we will do is for these uh, process improvements, optimizations, again, we believe that there's a lot of know-how within the company. So what we do is we organize workshops per department, per area. We bring in different peoples of different levels within there and we ask them, okay, what can be improved? What costs can be cut? What can be done more efficient? So brainstorming sessions in each of the, of the different areas. And the next step is once we've come up with all the different ideas of what can be done, that could be 20, 30, 100, whatever it is, you have to quantify that. So what is it going to cost to do that? What is the benefit? And what is the time? So you create a matrix. So then it's just about prioritizing. You start with your low-hanging fruit. What is going to be have the largest bang for the buck and can be done in the shortest time? And that is then that is your 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 plan. That is your uh, let's say your map of how you're going to start um, working on the different things. That so those fantastic. would be the big three areas, let's say, when you walk into a company. Fantastic, Matias. I think you you you've covered that. I mean, wonderfully well in a short space of time. So let's unpack a couple of things because uh, you know. Sure. You and I have been through these uh, situations before, you many more times than I have, for sure. Um, let's talk about the, the first thing you mentioned about management. What is it you look for um, when, you're, when you're looking at potentially an unhealthy exec team or leadership team, or perhaps even dysfunctional one? What do you look for? Because as you say, you don't have a lot of time. You know, maybe you got some star performers in that executive team, maybe not. So what's from your experience you know you've had many years of this what are you looking for when you know you've got to kind of potentially you know churn out some of those executives and how they collaborate as a team what are, you, what are the signs you're looking for at the executive level well i tell you what what i don't like is uh when you have uh, arrogance when you have people that think they've been in the industry for a long time and they know how to do things and things have to be their way well the company would not be in this situation if that would have worked so usually you find people that are very entrenched and then closed to ideas, to other people's ideas. And in some management teams, we've seen that these people could be dominated and they lead the organization down the wrong way. And a lot of their peers are just following because of their personality, because of how strong they are and, and their will. So you have to be fast to be able to get those people out of the organization. And what we look for is collaboration. No effort of these of this magnitude, no restructuring, no, especially with a stress company, can be done by one person or, or just two or three people. You read it's a collaborative process. So you need people that communicate, that are not looking just at their silo, but are looking at the, at the company, that are willing to, that are open to ideas. Uh, not people that have said, no, this is the way we've been doing things and we will continue doing that are open to ideas. So really to try to generate a collaborative environment, each one has their area of expertise, but that they're willing to work with others and collaborate. And and really we we do have a lot of meetings. We, we try because everybody has to be informed of what's going on. And we're, we're very much in these meetings, brainstorming ideas and challenging ideas. Uh, so it's really a collaborative process that we look for. So people that would fit into that type of, of team that we want to build. Got it. Okay. And you mentioned something else which is critically important, particularly in crisis mode, is communication. So, Matez, what have you seen? Because I've seen, you know, different versions of communications where, you know, it's crisis mode. 
Um, you know, some management teams will want to hold back for fear of spooking their employees. Some will be completely transparent. You get the, the change agent who comes in who wants to be ultra transparent about really what's going on because that's the best way to, yeah. to honor yeah. the, the employees and let them know what's going on. Tell us what you've seen and what works. Well, uh, uh, my style is what you just described as ultra transparency. Uh, I, I believe in that. I think it's very important. And and uh, yes, it could spook people out that that's right. Some people will get nervous about their jobs, about the future of the company. But I I believe it's very important to make everybody aware of the real situation of the company and the changes that have to happen. So I've, I hold town hall meeting, meetings in, 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 when it's been manufacturing plants, get everybody on the, on the floor and just tell them, introduce ourselves, tell us what our vision is, the changes that are going to happen and make sure that they all are, we're all on the same ship and we need their help uh, to be able to, to achieve whatever change we need to drive. So it's really, it's ultra uh, transparency. And sometimes you, you, you face resistance from management that say, no, we shouldn't be sharing that information. This should not be shared. But um, I'm, I believe in open books and sharing as much as possible. And I've seen that as well completely, Matthias. When it's completely open book and people know the truth, they usually, you know, they usually get in line and they, they want to help the company. And many of them have the company at their heart, right? So I believe in complete transparency. You don't hold back. Because once it yeah. gets out, if you've held back, that's even a worse death rattle, you know? You're right. That's right. That's right. So so communicate a lot. And we talked about communicating with the uh employees but as we said before also as the stakeholders yes and, and sometimes that can be scary because you say well that customer if he knows we're in problems maybe he leaves he'll be buying somewhere else and so forth but usually uh transparency um i think you're able to recruit more help that people are willing to to give you a chance uh to help you out if they understand and they see that you're transparent and you're really making an effort to improve things right so that has worked for me Perfect. This is this is a great conversation, Matez. Thank you. So um, let's turn the table a little bit around. Let's just let's let's ask the question another way. You know, companies get to this kind of sub-performing or distress distress level. So even before they get there, Matez, what would you say from your experience are the real business killers? What happens that leads a business to that point of sub-performance? How would you kind of categorize some key points? I think it depends on the type of business and the yeah. size of it. Um, there, there are different reasons that that can take it to that. One, if it's if it's a subsidiary of a larger company, the larger company maybe is not focused on it, so it's not giving the resources to that subsidiary because strategically it's looking at a different direction. It's maybe this is a different business, so it could be neglect from the parent company. Uh, be a, a parent company, uh, a corporation, a private equity, neglect from the owners of, of the company is one. So they don't invest in it. There's no investment and there's no investment in resources. And that creates a whole move within, within the organization. So that, that's one scenario. The other scenario can be complacency, complacency of management. Things are going well. Well, they've been going well for many years. They just continue uh managing as always being complacent not worrying about cash flow not worrying about maximizing uh their, their inventory that their, their all their key met metrics they're not maximizing they're just sailing and start suddenly the market starts shifting and they don't realize that and by the time they've realized that they've diverged from where the market is going and they become fat they become inefficient now it's it's a late or this team cannot cope with that. So complacency is, is another one, losing focus then of where the market is going and in really managing the, the company well. Uh, um, so th those can be some, some of the reasons. Let me think of, if anything else comes to mind of what could lead uh, to that. Then, then you have sudden shifts and in, 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 it could be in technology, it can be in regulatory, there can be shifts, big shifts that happen where management is not in a position to, to tackle those, to really react to those changes because it, it's a type of management 
that has been doing the same thing for a long time in a very comfortable type of environment. So they don't know how to how to deal with that. Absolutely. So what I heard, Matteo, failure to change. That was your your point, even around management, undercapitalization or investment. Um, excess overhead is one of them. Yep. Carrying yep. excess overhead. Um, you mentioned government and technological uh, changes. I've seen in a couple of turnaround situations I've been in, uh, Matthias, unprofitable pricing where you have to renegotiate. That is surprising, right? It is surprising, but it is yeah. true that they don't understand their pricing and they're selling products at a loss and yeah. they're not aware of that. So that, that and that could have, well, there, there's, there's a couple of reasons of, or things that could happen. One is they don't have the information to be able to know that their products are really loss making products. Uh, that is lack of information. The other thing that could happen, and when we talked about complacency or, or management that has been too long, is that they don't take the difficult decisions of cutting products because this product has been since the beginning, they've always had it, and they think that it's it's it has to be in the portfolio. So they are carrying products which they know are not profitable, but that is creating a lot of internal problems, be it in manufacturing, it's adding complexity to the inventory. There's a lot of cost that go beyond just the, the margin on the on the product that maybe they're they're not seeing. And as we said with products, the same happened with people. Um, when they have people that they're not, they know they're not good performers, but they just keep them because they've been there, he's been here for such a long time. So they keep people in positions where it's time for a change, where they should be changing. So be it with products or with people, they keep them longer than what they should. And they don't take the difficult decisions to uh, to cut them out. So let's go a bit deep on that because I heard a couple of things as well, Matthias, potential about diversification and over-dependence on certain products or customers, et cetera. So that's one thing. And and, and of course, uh, you know, the old fundamental accounting favorite, which is poor controls. Poor controls, yeah. In the organization, right? Um, but I want to unpack the kind of product margins and, you know, losses and the hidden liabilities potentially even before gross margin. So um, we start off the conversation. You've got to do the overarching kind of review. Where is it from a cash standpoint? Look at working capital, look at profitability, look at EBITDA margins, you know, level of debt and so forth. At what stage do you actually now go deeper to look at kind of a unit economics of the products, whether they actually really make money or not, or whether they're hidden liabilities? And, you know, what's the margin on these products versus the difficulty of, to your point of the complexity of either manufacturing or servicing them, when you get to that level to kind of look at the portfolio to see what are the ones which are keepers and which of the products potentially are ones that we should release? Yeah. Um, the, the problem that you have in a distress situation is that everything has to be done today at the same yes. time. And, and it's impossible because you don't have the resources. And if you want... You want the organization to focus on certain things. You can't try really what we said is to pass too many elephants through the, the keyhole. You, you just you have to do it one at a time. You can't really do everything at a time. You want to do as much as possible. And when you have things that are like very clear loss makers, you, you can cut those. You should cut those immediately. Um, in, in an airline that, that we had acquired, uh, its long haul route was losing five million dollars a month, and that was very clear. You didn't have to do too much analysis to know you had to cut that. And cutting it brought a lot of complexity in itself. But anyway, the ones that when it's obvious, you, you need to cut it. But if not, um, we first, as I said, first get the management team that needs to be in place, then cash control, look at your cash, see how you can keep the company uh, alive through the cash. Then you do the process, the optimization, what I said, the optimization of processes. And in these workshops, you also have workshops with the sales team and with uh, the, the, the marketing and so forth. And that is a good point where you can start looking at the different products that you're selling, the portfolios and how they work. And that there, as part of that, you can have a team that starts analyzing then different profitability of of the products and and that is going to help because that that is tied to 
the production process. It depends how your production process works. But in, in, in a dairy company we had, milk is your input. But then you can make either powder milk, yogurt, or liquid milk. You can just direct that. And there you realize that maybe you're you're putting a lot of you're, you're producing a lot of very low margin product when you can just shift the production and you put it in something that has higher margin. That is a level of analysis that comes, I would say, in this third category when you're when you're looking at process optimizations, process improvements, because in this type of manufacturing, it's directly related to your production process. You will then change or um, let's say raw materials from some machines to others if you have the capacity. Awesome. Okay. So let, let's go, go back to Matthias's playbook on um, assessing the potential for a successful turnaround, right? In a in an underperforming company. So we've done all this work, we've done the assessment, but Matthias, there may be systemic issues that Matthias can't do anything about. How do you know which ones now you can invest in and will provide, you know, a value play versus ones that just I need to stay away. How do you know that? And, and what, what's your what's I, I think you, around that? you hit the nail on the head when you said systemic yes. issues. Um, a company can be underperforming because of its management, as we said before, because the industry is having problems or the industry is having problems. So those are the two. It's management or, or the industry that is causing it. Then within the industry, you can see, is it something systemic or is it something cyclical? Because you also have industries which are cyclical. And, and those actually, it's good to go in in a, in a moment where it's down. And then yet you know you can ride the, the upside of it. So stay away from, or we try to stay away from industries that there's been a shift in the industry and there's a systemic change that makes it unprofitable or very difficult to be profitable. Because you could have the best management in the world, but you can never go against those bigger forces of an industry that has just moved out that has changed so stay away from those those don't, that's that's a red flag and that you won't invest now if there is a cyclical situation or there's a shift in the in the industry that you see is coming well that's a bet that you can take that uh cyclical is always difficult it's a timing issue it's like time trying to time the the stock market it's 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 tough it's difficult but um, if you have clear indications that there are shifts in, let's say, in, in, in the um, in, in consumer preferences and so forth, for example, I, I told you about the dairy company. One of our, our, our thesis there was that there started to be a change in the demand because China was starting to consume more uh, milk-based products, which they hadn't in the past. So yogurts and so forth, they were starting to, to open up and to consume more of that. Historically, they had not. So there we saw that the largest uh, powder milk producer in, in Australia, in New Zealand, was diverting its production from the Americas to, uh, to China. So that left then a demand gap here. So we saw that coming. And actually, that, that played well. That did happen. Um, but that was a thesis that we had before going in there. That, that was a, a, cyclic, a cyclical industry where we saw a change of occurring. So, so that's, but um, we like to invest in companies where it's management underperforming or there is a cycle which we think is about to finish and there's a shift uh, coming. Not if there's a systemic change in, in the industry because that we, we cannot, it's very difficult. We don't know how to do it. Usually that, that requires it can be done because you can reposition a product you can reposition a market you can but that requires time and money yeah and we look more for where you minimize the amount of, of money and the the time that you'll be in the investment got it so matt and we'll, we'll move on to once you've decided then to you know continue with the candidate a turnaround candidate but um, when we let off the conversation, one of the key financial metrics you look at is the EBITDA margin, all right, and yeah. maybe net profitability. So is there kind of a non-negotiable range? Let's say you go into it, you see a sub-performing company, it's lower EBITDA margin um, than maybe the its peers and competitors. How do you unpack that EBITDA? Because that's what, that was one of your, your top financial measures. How do you unpack the EBITDA to realize that, okay, 
I've got the possibility of quote unquote extracting value from the company. How, how do I know that? And what do you look at? If someone is kind of lower than its competitors, there may be an opportunity to improve it, but how do you unpack your analysis to understand what's the opportunity to improve the EBITDA margin? Well, we're assuming we're talking about a, a positive EBITDA. If it's negative, it's it's a little bit different there. There, it's more challenging because you have to be there. You have a, cash is being drained from the company most likely, yeah. and you have a very time, a very short term to to act. So you really have to identify very fast what can be done in that situation. But just when it is positive, but lower than it than its peers. You, you know there's an opportunity. And what we try to do, as I said before, is try to identify that opportunity before going into the company. So you have to have a clear a thesis on, on that investment. What is it going to be? What is it that you're going to do? You have to identify what it can be. And there, it doesn't necessarily have to be then a financial metric. It can be a market opportunity that you okay. identify, a, a, a product that that is being sold in, in one segment and it could be sold in, in, in a different one. or or So try to identify what is it that can be done to improve that EBITDA. And that you can do it by looking at their balance sheet, uh, as we said, the, the inventory that it has on hand or uh, their, their sales. So I, I, I'm, at that point, it's not necessarily a financial metric but more look at the business and really understand the business and what are the drivers of the business to see what can be done, what can be changed, if anything, to be able to improve that, that Evita. Got it. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. So now um, you've invested in a distressed company. You've decided to do that. What are the immediate steps you take to stabilize the situation? Well, cash is king. So, you need to control the cash. That's the first one, right? Yep. You're controlling your your cash. That that's what's going to help to the stabilization to make sure that you're able to uh, pay bills and and pay salaries and keep the liquidity of, of the company. And for that, it's the cash flow management, but also to see what other sources of cash do you have. Are you using your? Can can you do sales and lease back of of assets? That are available that's something that's available to you. you can do factoring of invoices if you have a large accounts receivables and year it's taking you time to collect so look for immediate sources of, of cash customers if you give more production if it's capacity constraint if there's a capacity a supply constraint if you give more to a customer will he be able to pay you up front or what can be done can you get cash from your customers or so look for ways that you can create this liquidity uh, above and beyond by what the normal cash flow of the of the company can can generate. So again, this goes back to cash is king. So focus on 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 cash. So that is the um that that's what we do to stabilize. Let's say to get as much money in so that you can then have the time that is needed to make the changes that will make the company uh, succeed in, in the long term. Got it. Okay. All right. And so there's always the age old, you know, short term versus long term perspective, Matthias. I know you deal with that all the time. So how do you manage that balance between short term fixes and long term growth strategies in these underperforming that, companies? That's very easy. That's very easy. Okay. Because if there's no short term, there is no long term. So focus on the short term, because if not, you don't have to worry about the long term. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be an issue. So um, usually as, as part of this, this uh, these workshops that we do in all the different areas, you you also find ideas of people that have of, of different products, of modification to products, or of, of um, new markets that could be entered with a product. And so there we, we, we separate what is cost reduction to stabilize the company, but we do keep all this intelligence that we got from the organization on possible new products. And once the company is stable, once the short term is guaranteed, there is a tomorrow, there is a next week, there is a next month that we're going to have here. That is where we already have that list of, of uh, potential new products, markets, or combinations 
And that is where we can start working on those. And that goes on the hand of what you said before about looking at the profitability of products. How So they could be products that will increase, have bigger margins than the others. And that is where you, you start working it. But you only start working on it once you're sure there is a tomorrow and a next week and a next month. Uh, but you already have that list. And yes, you have to start. Usually the problem is if you're going to launch a new product, it was a great idea. It's a complementary product. It's going to work. The launch of any product consumes cash. It, it, there, there is a, a moment where, so it's good to have these plans and not to launch them, not to consume cash prematurely until you are on solid ground. But if you're going to exit the company, if you're going to sell the company, you have to be able to tell a growth story. So you need these markets, these products to be able to generate the, the growth story that is needed beyond the stabilization and the uh, assuring the the permanence of the company absolutely let's let's uh let's go down a little bit one step down so how are you striking the balance between cutting costs and protect and potentially investing in more longer term initiatives that is a that's that's an art more than a science yes yes so it, it's it's really a a tricky question and i don't know if i have a, an answer that i can give you um if we have the resources be it the resources in people and in cash we will work on both things at the same time um in in in, in the dairy company there was this formula for a milk for babies that had been developed but never launched. So we that could be very, very, uh, we saw it could have very good margins. So early on, we had a small team do the market research, speak to distributors, uh, because we knew how to do the production of that, but to start seeing how the market could be prepared for, for that product. So we, we were able to start early on on that. As long as it was not dis distracting or detracting from the resources, of, of uh, eliminating all the unnecessary costs that we had and, and generating the liquidity, you can start with these pet projects that will take time to materialize, but you can have a part of the organization working on them as long as it's not consuming a lot of cash or management, let's say management time. There is a point after the stabilization that that's stabilization, that way I have to focus on that. You have to focus on the growth of the company. It's it, you you reduce you prune it until the point where it can grow strong, right? So the first is the pruning, but once you've done that, then you have to start growing. And for that, you already have to identify what are the growth avenues, what are the opportunities to grow, and have something that is started to be able to continue developing that. Got it, fantastic. And so I know this is the the process of the turnaround, and we'll get to post investment. Um, so in all this. People are insecure. Your your organization, it is an organism. They're insecure. They don't know if they're going to have jobs tomorrow. How do you keep them motivated, Matez? And how do you keep the culture intact? Well, given, you know, crisis situation and they don't know whether they're going to have a job potentially in 90 to 100 days. I'm throwing out some numbers here. I mean, how, 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 do, you, how, do, you, keep the, how do you keep the team and the spirit alive? Yeah, the team and the spirit is one thing, but you don't want to keep the culture intact. Because usually the culture has been part of the problem of why the company is in that situation. So you really, you know, you'll be surprised, but early on in, in the different situations we've, we've had, we've enacted a, a culture change, a change culture program, uh, where we work on the culture of the organization uh, to change it, to make it a, a lot more uh, willing to take risk, a lot more entrepreneurial in, in there. So we do enact a, a culture change that I did not mention, but I think it's it's very important um, because culture is so important in companies, so yeah. important. Um, so we, we do work with, with the culture of the company, but we want to change it. We don't want to keep it. And something that we usually do is with management and and that doesn't always happen is, but um, to ensure that they also have variable compensation that it's not just a fixed salary that they have, that uh, maybe sometimes we'll just go in and we'll try to variableize a part of their salary 
to make it based on objectives so that the whole organization or let's say as the management team is really focused on achieving objectives and and that's how you focus them so uh, have variable compensation have variable compensation that that's that's also something that we do and then is identifying whatever depends on the industry what it is what the kpis are and really publishing that having people the whole organization make sure they're all looking at the right numbers the big high level numbers uh, because you want them all focused on 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 the direction that we all have to go and not if it's just management's going there and the rest of the organization is just not knowing where to go so it has to go hand in hand uh variable compensation objectives driven culture change transparency in where we're going and what the the kpis where we have to keep our eye on the ball what those numbers are and then yes by department you can drill deeper just make sure those are published those are visible to everybody it, be it in production be it in, in, in quality be it in, in sales make those numbers big there clear for everybody to follow got it okay so um we've affected the turnaround plan now let's talk post investment so what are the, the KPIs um, that you focus on um, to measure the success of the turnaround plan? Well, the, the success is when, when you did your first analysis of the company uh, and you made your 100 day plan, you identified KPIs that were underperforming. So those are the ones that you want. So we said the first one is EBITDA. Are you at, were you able to raise your EBITDA to the average of, of the industry or above that? That's a clear indication that you have really enacted positive change through the management. So, so that is one. Then um, return on asset is, is, is usually these companies, you, you buy a big discount from, from what their, their price is because you buy based on its EBITDA, not its assets. So it's a, that's a bit trickier to, to use, but it's still the capital employed in the company, what the return is on the capital employed is is a metric that, that you can use. Um, so it, it's the KPIs that you've identified can be specific to that industry or the financials, as we talked before, and just to ensure that you've met your objectives that you've set out to meet. And after the investment, well, what you look at is your cash on cash return, for example, that's that's something, but that's at the at the exit once we've we've exited the company. Got it. Okay. All right. And so post-investment, when it comes to prioritizing changes, Matthias, what areas in your over three decades of, of experience in this area, what areas or aspects of the business typically yield the most significant impact on value growth? They thought I 30... My 30 years, you make me sound old, Richard. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. I can only say it to you, Matthias, because I'm in the same league as you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so what are the, the changes that create the most value? Is that? What yes. We're... Yeah. Your, 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 the investments, po you know, all, all this change has happened. Um, you know, you're talking about post-investment, but what areas typically yield the highest value, would you say, that you're investing in, you know? The highest value. Um, back to uh, changing management, that is going to create value because they are the ones that will drive the value. You cannot yeah. be doing everything yourself. So management drives the value. Then it's it, it depends very much on their circumstances and the type of company that you purchase. In, in some, it could be just pruning your product lines because you have products that are losing money. And, uh, and sometimes that's difficult because you have to get rid of maybe 30%, 20%, 30% of your revenues because of these products that are making bulk in revenues, but they're making you lose money. So uh, that's a difficult decision, but you have to do it. You have to be able to, to cut those loss making products. Then it's surprising how many inefficiencies there are in, in companies, in, in overheads. And in, in if you have sales office, make sure that you have the right number and and that it's not just sales offices for sales office. So it really depends on, I think it depends on each investment uh, that we, and what we work on, what will yield 
the, the best, let's say, bang for, for your buck. Um, if it's uh, cost cutting, if it's uh, consolidating production sites, that, that could be a case where you've got three different manufacturing plants and you can actually squeeze everything into two and you just close one down. So I, I think it's very uh, investment specific to, to that what the situation was of that company. Great answer, Matthias. Thank you for that. Great answer. All right, quick round. What are the lessons you've learned from your successful turnaround ventures? The, the lessons I've learned that it's there is no magic formula. You really have to look at each situation by itself and how, by how it is. Um, it's, you, you can't really generalize very much, but that culture is very important in a company. That's what I learned. And, and you can tell a company that the culture is, is not the right culture. You can know it's not going to do well and they're going to have problems. So you really need, uh, the, the, let's say, the how critical people are to, organi or to an organization, how important they are. I think that's, that's the lesson because we started talking about Management. Management is the problem. If, if, and, and that filters down throughout the whole organization. If you have a good management team and they're able really to empower people and help them uh, grow in their jobs and be uh, ambitious and be uh, risk taking, that culture will change the company. So that's very important. Uh, culture is, is, I would say, is, is key. Uh, and after that is making hard decisions sometimes we don't want to take make difficult decisions and some you have to bite the bullet and just do it and just do it complacency is going to kill a company um the status quo just maintaining status quo that kills the company so really um question every day the positioning of the company and if you're doing the right things. And if you're not taking action every day or every month or every, make sure that the company does things. It just not accepts the situation in which it is. Inaction is a, is a business killer. Matthias. Yeah. So, so what would you say? Because, you know, you've got to act quickly. There are some people who want 100% of information to make a decision. Oh, All right. 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 What would be your guidance in terms of decision making? Oh, you know, you know that, that's that's like a this. very good point. That's a very yes. good point because in distressed assets, you have to feel comfortable making decisions with very limited information. That's right. That's and right. how do you achieve? To, how can you make decisions with very? Because you don't have time for a report, for a study, for a, a whole consultant to come, team to come in and come up with recommendations. And and there maybe that's where the three decades decades uh, help or um, it's experience because it's a big gut feeling because you it's you have imperfect information so you have to be able with little information make the right decision and i think that's that's experience Absolutely. You, you've lived similar situations you you or people around you but you have to be comfortable not knowing everything and making decisions that's a very good point and and, and what's your what's your strategy in tact to kind of consume the information from the people who are really closest to the action. I mean, as you say, there's people multiple levels down who are so close to the action in terms of, you know, sales or product or whichever functional area they're in. How do you, Mateus, pull that information in very quick fashion? There's got to be a comfort level and a vulnerability for them to share this because, you know, you've come in there and your team's come in. How do you do that? How do you do it in such a quick fashion so that you've got as much information as possible value information in limited time where you're nowhere near 100%, you know, perfect in terms of information gathering, but you've got to make a quick decision. How do you do that? How do you, how do you engage the employee level to provide useful, appropriate and relevant and timely information? Yeah, that, that's, that's, let's say that the first step towards that is when you are open to your employees, when you're transparent, where you're communicating to them, that's the first step. You have to, they have to see in you what you expect from them. You have to see that you have to be approachable, you have to be uh, open, you have to be able to communicate. If they see that you're that way, I think they will, they retribute in the same currency that what you're giving them. 
if you are very autocratic and very uh, just giving direct uh, uh, orders and and so forth, people are going to close up. They're not going to open up to, to you. And so that is in the beginning. I said communication is key. So you communicate, you show that. And then in these workshops, the way to do that fast is in these workshops that we do initially with the different departments, with the different productions, with people of all different levels, because there they see that their opinion is requested, is asked for, is considered. So they do feel important because they are contributing. So you have to give them that forum, that space where they can contribute. And there they see that they are heard. Yes, we're here to hear. And you have to stage well before the, the, each of these workshops. You communicate what the purpose is and what the intent. But there, if they see that you're receptive and you're open to hearing them, they feel that they are treated as, as individuals that are they're, that they're important and that you really want to hear from them. So that is, and that's why it's important to do this together with a, cha- a culture change program. Yes. Where you're really transmitting these these values and these these things to the people and it has to be people can say if can really realize if you're being authentic or not so it really has to come out from a place of authenticity you really have to do it not because it's in the best interest but because you really believe in that and this is the way that you believe in management brilliant i love that answer mate so i've been in businesses where um you know and let's talk about the kind of the cycle you're talking about here, because I've been in businesses which were mired with, you know, political silos, um, laissez-faire attitude, no urgency. How do you strike a balance between being directive and being supportive, coaching, you know, delegative? How do you strike the balance because you're in an urgent situation and the culture yeah. may be one of a laissez-faire, non-urgent, don't really care, and that could be part of the culture? Well, how do you strike the balance of going in there and having to do something and enact action quickly? Right. I, I think to instill that sense of urgency is, is very important. And that is where you, you talk to them, to, to the people, to the organization, really in a, in a frank way. Look, we have to all uh, make changes. We have to, because if not, the comp- there won't be a company. Right. right. So you have to instill that sense of urgency yeah. Uh, up front and yes i elicit your 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 opinion your ideas but after that there's a firm decision and they have to see action because if you're just taking information but they don't see any action they don't see any changes they realize that it's a waste of time they're, they're not going to give any other ideas or people are not going to contribute so you really have to be able yourself your management team to enact change fast that has to be visible to people so yes, we're using that information. And, and if you're not in agreement, you explain, no, we're not gonna do that because of this, this, or this is a better idea, or this cannot be done at this point to communicate it, but that there is uh, there is assertive decisions being made and action being taken. And people generally love that. They get confident, they get motivated that something's happening and the business is moving in the right direction. You know, It's a domino. That is moving. Because usually these these uh, the situation of these companies there's been as you said inaction there has been no movement yes. and now they're starting to see movement they may agree with it or not agree but at least they see that change is happening uh, decisions are being made usually that's a problem decisions have not been made in the past difficult decisions are not made and you have to make difficult decisions you have to make decisions so it is again an art the balance of of being open. Be being a coach, but at the same time being assertive and making decisions, taking decisions, and empowering your team to take decisions. It's okay. better if you make a wrong decision. That's okay. We tolerate mistakes, but what we don't tolerate is no decision making, no action. That's what we don't tolerate. Great, love it. All right. Any advice for aspiring investors looking to enter the field of value investing in distressed companies? I encourage you because it, it's. I think the the rewards are are very very high. Um, t- two types of rewards. One is you have the ability really to enact change. So if you like business, if you like organizations, uh, this will give you the opportunity to really go into the company, look at it holistically, and start making changes, which in itself is very rewarding. If you see a company that's 
about to go under and you can turn that around and then you see a prospering company, you feel very good. The other side is the financial returns. Financial returns are, are very high in, in, in this. If you can really create value, you're rewarded for the value you've, you've created. So, so that's good. You, you do have to have certain, I, I think it's, it's important to have business experience. Um, so if you go into this to have business experience, to feel comfortable making decisions without having perfect information, you can't have analysis through paralysis or sorry, paralysis through analysis. You have to be assertive. You have to be able to make changes. Um, you have to have good analytical skills because you have to be able to look at numbers, look at a situation and assess it very fast. So analytical skills are important. Management skills and negotiation because you'll be negotiating with everybody. You'll be negotiating with your suppliers, with your customers, with if you have unions, if with employees. So negotiation is is very important. Negotiation skills as well. So um, if you have those uh, traits, if you have that, or if you if you don't, all that can be developed. Just continue doing the work you're doing, learning where you are in the industry, and at one point, uh, well, I do encourage you to to go into that type of of investing, value investing. Got it. Okay. All right. And so we'll recap um, from a, a conversation we had a bit earlier then. And these are the last two questions now, Matthias. Um, okay. From your experience, what are the most common mistakes made by businesses that contribute to financial distress? And I'm talking about really distressed ones. I know I'm going to have a part B to that question, but what are the common mistakes to avoid significant distress? let's say um, not focusing on cash flow of the yeah. company. You don't look at the cash flow uh, because that starts eroding slowly, slowly until you're in, in that situation. Um, not focusing on, on your cost structure. Yeah. You continue adding cost to the company, which is then very difficult to unload. Uh, inventory management uh sometimes you don't you don't realize how much cash you have tied up in your inventory it's it's eating your your cash having all that there if you're not rotating it so it's i think it's basically not focusing on what are good management practices that that's what what, what can lead you to that situation over in depth you took on too much debt that could have been because you wanted to grow fast you wanted to grow into a new area and you took on more debt then you could, and then there's been a reversal in the circumstance. Like for example, interest rates just shoot up and it catches you with a lot of debt. And there you, you have a problem. You have a liquidity issue that you didn't plan for. So, and a lack of planning. You, you have to have plans. You have to make plans and have contingencies because maybe everything does not work out the way that you expect it to work out. So if, if you're going to take on debt to either buy a, a a company or, or or launch a new product or do something. What happens if that launch takes instead of the time that you planned a year or two years, it takes longer, three years of, of consuming cash and not generating. In what situation will the company be? So have have a plan and have contingencies if things don't work out as as you think they will. Awesome. And and last question for the companies who have got a good management team, they're not distressed but they're subperforming. What advice would you give that management team to, you know, elevate and, and, you know, optimize their financial performance? What advice would you give them? I, I think it's don't be complacent. Try to push yourself and your team harder. Every day, evaluate where you are. Uh, I think complacency, the status quo has a lot to do with it. So you can create not a distress, but create the sense of urgency, of importance, of really pushing yourself and your team to achieve more. Just like in personal development, you want to be the best version of yourself. Well, help everybody within the company, your, your team, the one to be the best version of themselves, to push themselves, to say, what can we do better? Challenge the status quo, challenge where you are. And 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 that's that's culture. That's culture. So really... Let's say if you want to distill it, let's focus on the culture of the company. Love let's it. focus on the culture. That's what I would tell them. Focus on the culture and have everybody then uh, give their best for the company and for themselves. 
to grow. Love it. Matthias, this has been fantastic, man. There's a kindred spirit. I uh, This oh, is yes. super. This is, a, this is not only business successful business turnarounds. This is about running a profitable business and maximizing value. This is everything. This has been a fantastic hour, Matthias. So I really appreciate this. Um, I honestly can tell you that that espresso did wonders. Um, it was fantastic. <laughs> well done. <laughs> this was superb, Matthias. And thank you. I know the listening audience are going to get tremendous value from this. Super. Richard, I, I thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. So I'm uh, looking forward to, to going out and having a good lunch together. Awesome. Thank you very much, Matthias. Take very care. Nice Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.